Amen. Thank you, worship team. Let's give them a hand. Thank you so much for leading us into the presence of God. Yeah, what Pastor Lisa was saying, just with your giving and what we're able to do, let me tell you, this whole church was transformed Friday night. We scared the bejesus out of your kids and <laughs> prayed it back into them at the end. And But no, we had kids who were here who, were here who had never come to the youth group and we just had an amazing time of prayer even after the event. Um, and so God is moving in that, and it was, it was awesome. Yesterday was just so powerful. We had so many people that came through uh, the trunk retreat and were blessed by it, the community, and, and just cars were driving by honking. And, and we know that so many families were blessed because of your generosity and serving. And so we want to encourage you to keep... Uh, believing and, and, and keep sowing into what God is doing here at Victory Church. Amen? Amen? I don't have Facebook, but once in a while I'll pop on my wife's, and I don't know, I'm seeing the elf memes popping up all over, which means Christmas is coming very soon. So um, we also want you to know you could talk to uh, Rachel. They're going to be beginning their practices this Wednesday for the kids' choir. They're going to do a special on Christmas to bless us. How many of you were blessed by them on Pastor's Appreciation? Wasn't that awesome? Oh my goodness, the joy of the Lord was in those kids. It, it made me want to get up and start dancing, especially that one girl. I was just twirling and going away from the group. And, but uh, we know that we're blessed by our kids. And so if you're interested and want to be involved in that way, you could see Rachel for that. God's doing so much. Amen? Amen. Well, as you're in a series on Back to the Basics. And so for the next few weeks, uh, when Pastor comes back, he's going to begin um, talking about end times stuff. And as you know, we look at our world and a lot is going on. A lot is happening with Israel. I was actually walking with Pastor Richard um, Thursday and, you know, I, I lack a lot of info when it comes to Israel and those kind of things. And so I was asking him just questions and things to help make more sense. And um, with his knowledge and expertise, he was just sharing and helping to kind of tie things together. And we were just talking about, man, what if the rapture what if we are in that generation where we're going to be a part of that? And we just started going back and forth and talking about the what ifs and how that should change how we live. And so we want to encourage you in the next few weeks to be praying for pastor, to be praying for the atmosphere here, but also to be using the outreaches that we've had to be praying for those who are in a community to come in. It's a great opportunity and to invite family and friends, maybe those who have questions as they're looking at the news and, and seeing all of this chaos that's beginning to erupt. We as the church should not be surprised by it. It's surprising, but we shouldn't be surprised by it because Jesus told us that this stuff would begin to happen. You know, we have the recent uh, shooting in Maine that just took uh, the nation by, and I, I don't even want to use took the nation by surprise because we're seeing too much of it. It's like we're just waiting for the next one, and what's it, what's it revealing is that there, there is an enemy who is alive and well in our nation who's using people to do very evil things, and it causes a lot of people to have questions, to have frustrations, and so... Um, what Jesus is doing to get his church ready. Because uh, I heard a pastor say that the church is the only reason why the things aren't fully erupting and fully blowing up and becoming bigger. We are a preserving factor right now on this earth. And when God takes that away, the, the craziness that is going to come from that. And so we have uh, a duty, we have uh, a job to do right now. And God, I believe, is preparing his church for that. Amen? Amen. And so I just want to pray before we jump into the word of God um, and just pray that we would begin to get on the same page with what God is doing. You know, we all have families, we have things that we need to do, we have our routines, we have our agendas, we have our jobs, but God is looking for people to be on the same page as him. It's not that he wants to disrupt our families and our jobs, but he wants us to be in the same channel and flow of what he's doing so that when we go to our jobs, when we are in the world, that we are in tune with his spirit. Amen? You know, it's funny to think of like the event that we do with Grog. It's, 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 an event, it's a game called uh, Grog, but it's Manhunt Meets Hide and Go Seek. And we do that as a fun thing, but the underlying factor is we want to get kids into the church to have fun and have connection. And when they come in, then we give space for the Holy Spirit to move. And at the end of the night, it was so powerful. We gave some uh, time for God to just speak. And we had, actually, the altars were full of kids at the end. 
um, who were just hungry. And we, as leaders, got to lay hands on them. We had a pastor from another church that was, his youth pastor couldn't be here, so the lead pastor was there with his youth. And he came up and just gave a little word and encouraged kids to come up. And we got to pray for them. And, and at the end of the night, we were just talking and saying, it's, it's not about the games. It's about getting these students in tune with what God is doing. Amen? And the enemy, is a, he distracts us. He's a, I, I don't know about you, but I struggle with distractions, and I still do. You know, and, and we have to get focused on what God is doing. Amen? Amen. So let's pray right now, and I want to share some scriptures that are going to lead into this series on, on teaching about the end times and, and what the different elements mean and, and what is the rapture and when is it going to happen and, and how does Israel tie into everything that's going on. And so there's going to be a lot of questions that are going to get answered in this series, and we're praying that people are going to come in hungry for that. And it's going to take the chaos that the world is going through, and it's going to put us, give us a greater focus on God's word. This is a roadmap to the end of time, and we know the end. We may not know all the details. We may not have set dates, but this is a roadmap to the end. So when we read it and when we know it, we can actually give peace when people are going crazy. I was at my barber shop, and it's just funny because what's happening in Israel and everything that's erupting, people are asking questions. And so when you begin to tell them that things like this are going to, you begin to see a peace come in because for people, they think it's the end of the world and that's it. But God has, we, there's a hope in Jesus Christ. And though while things get crazier and they will get crazier, um, we have this peace that the Holy Spirit gives us. So let's pray right now and just ask God to open up our hearts so we can look into his word as we get prepared for this, this, uh, this series to begin back again. Heavenly Father, we pray right now Holy Spirit, would you open up our hearts? We believe that in the time of prayer and worship that you've softened the soil of every heart in this room. And so it is now ready for your word, which is the seed to be planted. And so Holy Spirit, would you do that right now? Every person in this room right now, just I invite you to lift your hands right now just to receive. Holy Spirit, you see these hands and the, it just, it's, this just represents surrender. We surrender thoughts. We surrender agendas. We surrender time. We surrender our own opinions. We surrender everything to you so that we can receive the fullness of what you have for us today. There are people that you want us to meet this week And God, you want to do something in this moment so that we are in tune and we don't miss those divine appointments. So Holy Spirit, would you show us that you will equip us. You will give us the words to say. Lord, you will give us the boldness to go out and to speak, God, in the moment that you have called us to with employees, with people in the stores. God, would you tune us into what you are doing right now as we look into your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. If you could just open up with me, we're going to be in the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, in the 14th chapter. I want to ask you guys, how many of you love to eat? It's okay, you can raise your hand. I'm not asking if you love gluttony, but if you just love to eat. Eating is good. Eating is a good thing. And have you ever been invited to something where you knew there was going to be good food? Anyone in here? You, and so you were happy that you got the invitation, and maybe you were a little happier that you just got the invitation because you got to partake of the food that was going to be there, right? I've done that before where I was more excited about the food at the event than the people who are actually at the event. And I know for, for our wedding 13 years ago, one of the things that we wanted was good food. Pastor Richard, if you're watching, you'd be very happy because we found a, a local um, lady who did home-cooked Italian food. She owned her own catering business, and nothing was frozen or store-bought. Everything was homemade. I don't even know how we got her number, but she, she was a recommendation. And uh, for those of you who are at our wedding, I hope that the food was good. And, but she made everything fresh. And usually you don't eat. People tell me you don't eat on your wedding, but I was, I, that was not going to be me. I was waiting for my plate to come. And <laughs> the hardest part of, of, of a wedding, and those of you who have been married Maybe you will agree with me. The hardest part of planning for a wedding is what? It's the invitations, who you can invite. And I remember for Tara and I, when we were planning, it's like, because you know, the bigger the wedding, the more money that it's going to cost. So we had to figure out our budget, what we could do. 
And, and so I think we had like 200 or something in my head. I'm like, oh, that's a lot of people. But when you sit down and you start to write friends and family, and it starts to make this list, we were reading this book and it said you have to make an A, B, and C list, which means you have to start cutting people from the C if you don't have enough. And then you have to cut people. For, so the A list are the people who are definitely coming. And then if you have enough room, you can go into the B list. And if you still have enough room, then you can go into the C list. And that was hard. I remember we were sitting there like, like almost in tears, like these people are going to be so mad if we don't have them and if we don't invite them, well, and I'm like, well, I don't like this family member, so maybe we can push them out and we'll bring this friend in. And there's a lot of stuff you have to do to make this list possible. But you know the day of the wedding, you still feel bad because you know that there were people who were not able to be there. And so when we're talking about the end times and we're talking about what God is doing, I want to read a parable that Jesus shared with the people who he was sitting at to help bring truth to a principle that was very key to the end times. And so in Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 12, I'm going to read through um, verse 24, go back and pull a few things out, and then we're going to just take some time to pray at the end um, as we get prepared in our spirit for what God is going to begin to do in the next few weeks. So it says, He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. So let's stop there for a second. Jesus is beginning to show us principles on how we are to live. We find routines. We find things. We have friends in our lives. If if you make plans to go out, you call certain people, right? And you don't call certain people as well. We have certain people that we have in our lives that we're, we're the most comfortable with. They, they feed us. They, they pour into us. They make us feel special. And so by nature, we gravitate towards those people. And what Jesus is saying is there is a time where all of this, all that we're in, this world is going to be gone. It's all going to be gone. And what he's teaching us is that, you know, he's, he's sitting with, you know what I love is, the Pharisees were people who were always watching Jesus. Earlier in chapter 14, it would say that the Pharisees would watch him closely. And this was a watching that in the Greek it meant they were watching with ill intent. They were always trying to see if they could catch him. And what I love about Jesus is although he rebuked the Pharisees, he still sat and he ate with them. He still loved those who he knew were watching him to trap him. And in life, we, as in our flesh, we're gonna, we will distance ourselves from people who, who are speaking ill things, who are doing things in us. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, God has put a mandate on us that whoever we are around, we are to show the love of God to. Amen? Amen. The scriptures tell us that we are actually, um, I was talking, we had our youth leadership meeting a couple Sundays ago, and I was sitting with David in my living room. We were talking about um, making the the epistles and the, the prison epistles come to life. And one of the best ways to explain to people when you're reading through them is that it's a letter that is written to the church. We look at the Bible as just sometimes script, and we think it's boring and it doesn't make sense. But when you start to look at it as a letter, if someone were to write you a letter that was very personal, how many of you know you would take time to sit and you would read it? Maybe you would read it again. You'd put it in a special place to pull up again when you needed more encouragement. And so... Many of us don't read the Bible because we don't realize that it is a letter that, that, that when it comes to the prison epistle, that Paul is writing to a church to encourage them. And he also tells us in 2 Corinthians that we are actually a letter to the people of this world. Isn't that powerful? In 2 Corinthians, uh, if you could put that scripture up. Do you have it, Bill? 2 Corinthians 3. It says this in verse 2, you yourselves are our what? Letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. Look at the next verse. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Isn't that really cool? You and I are a letter not by ink, but by the spirit that's in us. 
so that when you are in a room with people, maybe they're people or family members who've said things to you and you're at a reunion and, 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 and they've said things behind your back and you're aware of it and the flesh just wants nothing to do with it. Wherever you go, you are literally a letter that sits in that room that shows them and reflects them who Jesus is. Isn't that powerful? It's convicting, but it's powerful. And we have to allow the Spirit of God to work in us. And when Jesus would sit with the people who hated him and wanted him dead because that he was beginning to get more glory than them, he still sat and he loved them and he gave them opportunity for that Spirit to work in their hearts. Unfortunately, for some of these men, the Pharisees, their hearts actually grew harder. And that's going to happen in life sometimes. We don't control people's destiny. We don't control people's decisions. But we are a letter that God has placed in our hearts. And when God puts us wherever we are, with our families, with our workplaces, we allow the Spirit of God to work. But it's ultimately their decision if they're going to receive it or not. And so Jesus is sitting in this house in Luke. And it says, again, in verse 12, and he And he said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return. So what he's saying is culturally, especially in America, it's who you know, right? It's influencers. And you want to be around people who are influencers because they they can help you get more followers, get more likes. And we do that because it's all about your stature. It's all about your status here in America. And in the Greek here, Jesus isn't telling this man, don't invite your friends ever. But what he's basically saying is don't habitually only invite people who are going to benefit you. And sometimes we can adopt that mindset even in the church world where we only want to be around people who are of like status in our lives. And we hang around only those people because we know what they can do for us or what they've done for us in the past. And Jesus is saying, with the kingdom of God, we've got to break that mold. We've got to get out of that mindset. And we've got to be led by the Spirit and love those who God has called us to love. The letters that were written to the church were universal. They weren't this. They were written to a specific church, but we have them now, and we can apply them to our own lives. We didn't have to attend the church at Corinth just to to, to make sense of that letter to Corinth. It's a universal thing that applies to believers even now, and God is breaking that mold even off of the church. There's There's no worse feeling than when you don't get invited to something or you feel left out. Can I get an amen? Isn't that the worst feeling to, be, to, to feel like you're being left out? And I believe social media has done damage in our culture because of that. Because before social media, no one ever knew where you were going. No one ever knew who you were hanging out with. And so when you go on your feed and you're constantly scrolling and you're seeing, oh, well, my friend went to this restaurant with that person. Why wasn't I invited? Or this person got tagged in there. Why didn't I get invited? And all of a sudden, it, this bitterness and stuff grows in you. And when, before all that stuff, who cares? I'm not saying to get rid of it, but we have, to be, we have to be mindful that the enemy will use things to try and cause division and to try and cause a bitterness of lack of being and fear of being left out. And so this man was inviting people to his house that were for his benefit. And Jesus is telling him, get out of the habit of bringing people into your house who are just going to benefit you. That's not what the kingdom of God is about. Amen? Amen. When we do ministry here at Victory Church, we don't go to certain areas just to do ministry. We do ministry in a very broad sense. We had a teen ministry Friday night outreach where it was built for teenagers. Saturday morning, we had uh, an outreach that was built for kids, for our community. We have a team that goes out to the streets and brings food to those who are lost. We have so many different facets of ministry here at Victory because we're not just focusing on one person. We're focusing on everyone, and that's the mindset that God wants with his church. Amen? Amen. That's the mindset that God wants with you in your job. Amen? Amen? In verse 13, he says, but when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So this mindset of the kingdom If we're believing that we're living in the end times and we're seeing the birth pains get closer and closer together, these contractions of what's happening with Israel, what's happening with Russia, what's happening with even in our own nation, we have to adopt this mindset. There's an urgency to go out. 
And we don't chase after people who we're comfortable with. We are led by the Spirit. Amen? Amen? Amen. And God will allow us to do that. Um, There was a moment in my life where there was a person who, of higher status in a church, and I won't say his name, and, um, but they were of a higher status. And for me, it was very tough because I, I was not invited to certain things because of that status. And there were friends of mine who were my age who would get invited to go to these things, and the invitation would never get extended to me because I just, I was different. And you know what I mean by that. I'm not talking about skin color. I'm talking about status. Some people had money. I, we, we had everything that we needed growing up. But we didn't live in a mansion. My mom's room consisted of a, a room in the side of the house that had no door. And that was her, she had a little cubby her whole life because she adopted nine kids. We didn't have a, a mansion with eight rooms. And, and, and so sometimes in the church world, you, people get put on tears. And I never got to address that, but I know how I felt when I never received those invitations. And God is calling us as a church to take off those lenses that we view people as and to love them and see them the way that God loves them. And that has has to be broken in order for us to do the Great Commission. Amen? Amen? It is an amazing thing when you pour out to people and you're not expecting something back. What we did yesterday in the community with Rachel and her team, we're not expecting things from these families coming in. But as Pastor Lisa was saying, money and time were invested for this event. You guys came early on your days off. Many of you work long weeks, but you came early. You came on a day where usually you could just be relaxing with your family, but you came and served, you set up, you did things, you poured money into it. You loved on these families that were coming through and you have no idea what God is going to do as he planted those seeds of love in those families' hearts. You're not doing it to receive anything. We're not doing it just to try and get people in the door so we can say, oh, this is how. We're doing it because we want God to touch lives. We want God to bring souls out of hell into heaven, and we can do that through events like this. Amen? Amen. There's such a great blessing when you can pour into something or somebody and you don't expect a return. God sees that, he blesses that, and he honors it. Even when he teaches us how to pray in the book of Matthew, he says to go into a closet and close the door. And when your your heavenly father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. But with the Pharisees, he says they did it out in the open. And one of the things that he said to them is they have received the reward in full. Would you rather receive your reward in full, which is the praise of man that is temporary, or would you have, rather have the rewards of your heaven father who sees what is done in secret? We have to adopt this principle that when we, when we go out, even in evangelism, we're not doing it to receive something back. Once we take those lenses off, the Holy Spirit can use us to reach anybody. Amen. Isn't that awesome? One of the jobs that I had I've had a lot of different jobs growing up, even when I was in ministry. And what God is showing me is, you know, when I worked at Smith & Wesson, I went from being full-time at a church to going to a place where the only people I worked around were armed um, ex-military and police officers. And what I've seen God do is, is when you allow the Holy Spirit, you almost become like a, a, a wild card. How many of you guys have played the game Uno. Isn't the wild card the best card, right? Because if you don't have the right number or the right color, you can throw that wild card down and change it, and it can adapt to anything that's on the pile. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. We become a wild card in any situation or circumstance where the Holy Spirit can freely move. I was intimidated sitting there talking to these men who were ex They had all these crazy stories, but what I saw God do in that year is it's unbelievable where I've seen grown men who were military coming to me with issues with their marriage, with issues with things that are going on in their personal lives. We are that universal letter that is sent to people who need to experience the love of God. Amen? Verse 15, it says, when one of those who reclined at table With him, heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. 
Verse 16, but he said to them, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. So we talk about this banquet. I may have shared this story before, but when I was at Zion, uh, it, when our school moved from Barrington to Haverhill, um, which is 30 miles north of Boston, the student committee or whatever you call them, the student union would throw a party every year for the students and everyone was invited and they spared no expense. And so what they would do is they would go out to the best wing place and they would get wings of countless wings of all different flavors. And, um, and I, don't, I, I don't know if well, it might have been for the Super Bowl. And um, they had food, they had mozzarella sticks, they had pizza, they had all of this stuff and you could smell it. And so I remember I had a night class and all we were thinking about, all the students were thinking about was getting out of this class and getting over to that meal and, and getting to eat this food. And what we loved is we were all invited. And so we're sitting in this class and all of a sudden, like my stomach started to go. Uh, in one of the buildings, they had a bathroom that looked like it was a dungeon. It wasn't on the same level as the classrooms. You had to go down these stairs into the basement. And so I went down into the bathroom and I, I was in such pain. I had never experienced this before. I was literally lying on the floor of the bathroom. I was in such pain. And in my head, it's like I wasn't even thinking about the food at that point. I was dealing with this pain. And so I, I text my friend. I said, I, I can't come back to class. Can you grab my backpack and my books? I got to get back to my dorm. So I somehow made my way across campus, crawled into bed, and I was just, I was out. All of a sudden, like 15 minutes later, I hear a knock at the door. And it was the professor from, the, from our class. Number one, I'm glad that I wasn't faking because that would have been a horrible, horrible situation. He didn't say anything except he came into the room. He put his, now this guy had like a catcher's mitt for a hand. It was like he had hula hoops for rings. His hands were huge. He came and put his hands on my stomach and he just began to pray in the spirit. He lifted his hand, he turned around and he went back to the class. I actually got out of bed. Whatever pain there was, all of it was gone. I was so excited. So now I went from the pain back to the, I can go to the food. And the class had just finished. So I, I remember walking in and all of my classmates who were in that class are like looking at me like, what are you doing here? And I said, I was healed. And they're like, oh, sure, sure. They started that. There's no, you know, you just went away to get out of the class. But, but I remember that celebration because all of my friends were there. No one was excluded. The food was top of the line. The fellowship was amazing. And that's what the kingdom of God is like. God is preparing a banquet for those who are a part of his family. And I love that analogy that he's creating this feast. Did you know we're going to eat in heaven? Yeah. It says it in the Bible. How many of you say amen? Amen. Imagine what it's going to be like to eat and not get full and not have all that stuff that they inject into our food. We, don't even, we can't even begin to imagine it. But God is preparing this feast. We're going to get to sit at this, this table and see each other and, and not have to, to, to pray about death and, and sickness. And all. It's going to be such a different environment. We have no idea. And so he says... And at the time for the banquet, this is verse 17, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. So before the invention of clocks in the Bible days, when a party this big was thrown, they would not tell you the time that this party was going to take place. Only the date was set. And the time of the party was not set until the morning of. Some of you still operate according to that with some of your parties and, and things. But think about that. You had to commit to it before you knew the time. You had to prepare your day knowing that it could be morning, it could be afternoon, it could be night, but you had to commit to it first. And so these invitations were sent out. And it goes on to say in verse 18, but they all alike began to make excuses. They began to make excuses. I know when I was raised in the church, I said yes to Jesus when I, I was a kid. I didn't have a job. I didn't have to worry about taxes or, or different things. You know, when you're a kid, you don't have to worry about all that stuff. So yeah, yes, Lord, I'll follow you. That's, that's an easy choice. 
But when the time comes for God to call you and to use you, what happens is you build up your own life. We have a handful of kids that are in our youth group that are making, are filling out college recommendations for teens. They're filling out applications on where they want to go and, and what they want to do. And I was in that seat before. I was raised in the church and, and I told God what I was going to do. I didn't include him and say, God, where do you want me to go? And so the thing is, is if we are praying and wanting God to use us, there's going to be a time where that invitation, God's going to say, I want to use you now. And what happens is we begin to make excuses about not wanting to be a part of this great banquet. What blows my mind is what I know now about the word of God, it, it's, it's mind-blowing that if Christianity is real, that if Jesus is who he says he is, why would people reject the invitation? That is the question of the decade, the century. Why do we reject this invitation? And I believe that it's answered in these next few verses by the excuses that some of these people made. They had already made a commitment to come, but they had gotten to a point in their life where they had built things up and when the time came to go to the event, what was more important to them is what they built instead of what they committed to. And look what the excuses were. It says, but they were all alike. So underline that. There's a lot of people who God is calling, he's inviting. But the excuses may sound different, but they're all alike. And it goes on to say, but they were all like, they began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Something that you're going to see as a common thread is the first, there's three excuses. The first two deal with more material things. The last deals with more family things. But how many of you know when you buy something new, you want to spend time with that thing, right? When you get a new car, you don't just pull it in the driveway, you're going to go driving places that you normally would never drive before because you have a new car, right? When you get a new Apple product, I love getting new Apple products. I love the packaging, and I, and I tell Tara, when I get a new Apple product, I got to have the kids out of the room. I want to have time to open it and have time to inspect it, charge it, and see all the new things with it. We spend time when we get new things, right? And there's nothing bad about that. But if we allow materialism to come in and take the place of God's calling on our life, then what we do is we make excuses instead of saying, I just don't want to come. There are people, myself included when I was young, where I would make excuses rather than just say what the truth was. And the truth was, I don't want to go. You know what's interesting is it says that this person bought a field and he says, I want to go and look at it. Who buys something and then goes to look at it? When you buy a used car, you go and check it out first, right? You don't just buy it and then go, let me see how it is. So we're already seeing these excuses begin to unravel. You don't buy a house just by looking at it. Oh, I'll go on Zillow. I want that house. I'll buy it, and now I'll go see. And you walk in, and there's no floors. The walls are gone. You go inspect it. You check it out. You see if you want it. You walk through it. You imagine yourself in it. Then you pay the cost. And what Jesus is getting at is there's so many people who have maybe made the decisions beforehand, the emotional decision because it sounded good. And when, it, it's called, when you're called kind of to the plate, you begin to make excuses because you realize you didn't really weigh out the cost. You made a decision because maybe it sounded good. You made a decision because your parents wanted you to do it. You made a decision because your pastors told you to. But when that spirit comes, the proof is going to be what you say. Look what it goes on to say in verse 19. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Who buys oxen and then doesn't examine them? It's the same principle. You don't invest your money in something that you know is not going to be worth something. You want to check it out and see if it's worth it, and then you invest in it. 
And we have to, sometimes we have to step on the spiritual scale and allow the Holy Spirit to see when I made that commitment to Jesus, was it out of emotionalism or did I really count the cost of what it is? He goes on to say, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. It's crazy. It's so practical though. We see it as staff in church. People make commitments, whether it's to membership class or baptism or and those are good things. And sometimes we can really mean it, but you have to understand that sometimes the attacks will come once we've made the commitment. And if that commitment was true, then we are going to endure through those because God gives us the strength to do it. Amen. But sometimes it's not always going to be convenient. We look at the life of Paul, who radically was changed by an encounter with Jesus. And his life was everything but convenience. He was whipped. He was shipwrecked. He was, he was cast out. He was talked about behind his back. He was thrown in prison. And yet he still found joy because he counted the cost. Before we start this series next week, I think we have to, we have to jump up on the scale as individuals and determine, have I counted the cost of following Jesus? I don't want you to think it's about, well, now if I say yes, then I'm going to be persecuted. I'm going to be, sl it's not about that. It's about an, an invitation that went out. Every person in this room has been invited. Why would someone reject that invitation? It's because we allow the circumstances of this world, the distractions of this world to take precedence over that initial commitment. Now look at this as we finish up. The worship team, if actually, if you want to just come up. Verse 21. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry. You have to understand that if you've ever put on a banquet or you've ever put on a, a party, I know... Pastor Lisa did so much work for Pastor's 60th party. That wasn't just something done overnight. There was planning. There was invitations. There was food. There was following up with people to get people to come in and celebrate. There's nothing worse than when you do so much hard work and you invite people. They don't even have to do anything. They just have to come and eat. And they say, no, I've got, I've got better things to do. I don't want to come. God has prepared heaven for us. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. You have to do nothing but accept the invitation. Amen. It doesn't matter your status. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter what you've come from. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. None of that matters. But when that invitation comes in the mail, all you have to do is check. I'm committed. That's it. But there are people who reject it. If I plan for something and nobody showed up or no one sent in their RSVPs, I'd be a little angry too because of the amount of work that I did. But it's not just about the work. It's because God loves us. It's not about works. He loves us so much, he just wants us to be around that table. Growing up, my mom, she just had an amazing anointing around our dining room table. My grandfather built this beautiful table. And growing up, I would always see people of different walks of life always around that table with my mom. She would sit and listen to their stories and, and talk about life with them. People who had money, people who didn't have money, people who were outcasts, people who had status. It didn't matter. All were welcome at my mom's dining room table. We would do parties. Every year we would do this 4th of July party where we would invite the whole church. 
we'd go out and get the food and I'd do the grilling and people would come and just hang out. And I remember one year we just kept inviting people. And we actually had to make another Costco run because we had over 100 people show up. We didn't realize that that many people were coming. We said to my mom, Mom, we have like 100 people coming. And she said, well, I'm going to go to Costco. She'd hop in her car. She'd drive to Costco. She'd fill up the car. She wouldn't, she wouldn't weigh out the cost. She'd just fill it up because she wanted people to come and, and enjoy. And I never forgot that celebration. We had so many people who just came. Some were swimming. Some were just hanging out by the pool, talking, socializing. I grew up under that. So for her, it was her joy to see the dining room table filled. I think that's why she adopted so many kids. She loved family dinners. We have a Heavenly Father who wants to see his table filled with people. He knows that this world, this isn't it. He wants us to experience what we were designed to be. And so he got angry when these people rejected it and made excuses. And he goes on to say, look at this. He got angry, but then he said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, sir, what you commanded has been done. And, there's, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways, the hedges, and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. This speaks to the heart of our Father. He wants every seat filled at that table. Every seat. But he says, you've got to go out and you've got to compel them. Sometimes people have to be convinced that they're loved. We don't do it out of force, but we do it because we have to convince them because they've been so unloved. My mom adopted so many kids who were abandoned at birth. We didn't know our fathers. We, didn't, we had to be sometimes convinced that we are loved. For years, my mom would say it, and it never registered. And so she would tell us over and over and over again. And there are people in this world who have to be compelled. They've been cast away. They've been pushed to the side. We had a woman from my church growing up who was sexually abused. Her daughters were molested. And the church cast her out because she was a little off. But my mom would buy gifts for these girls. She'd have this woman over at that table week after week after week, loving her, pouring into her, convincing her that God loved her. And that's the heart of our father. There are people in this world that need to be compelled to accept this invitation. Not because they don't want to go, but because they don't feel worthy enough to receive that invitation. And what God is saying is, I'm done with those who are making excuses. You want to make an excuse and not come? That's fine. We're going to take your invitation. We're going to give it to somebody else. And those are the people who are going to populate it. As I close in prayer, I want to share one other thing. In verse 24, it says, For I tell you, none of these men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Those who made excuses, those who lost sight of their original commitment. As you know, my wife and I, our family, we're living the hotel life right now while our house is getting redone. And, and it's crazy because when we get breakfast in the morning, we have these ladies who serve the breakfast. And the hotel that we're in is kind of an uppity, it's a, it's a nice hotel. And I've watched as people of status how they treat people who are servants. And we've watched our girls run and give hugs to them. Every single morning, they make their way to show them how much they love them. And these breakfast ladies come up to us and we, they say, we can't, we can't believe how much we're loved by your girls. They give Tara and I conviction. We actually were in the hotel for a few weeks, then we moved back into our home, but then we had to move back out, back into the hotel. And the first thing that when we told our girls that we have to go back, they said, we get to see our friends. And that first breakfast when we moved back in, and they saw our two girls run into the breakfast place, the joy that Tara said was on their faces. 
those who are looked down upon, those who are outcast. We are a love letter written to those to compel those to accept the invitation. They talk about church with them. They talked about our outreach, our trunk or treat. They said, we're going to trunk or treat today. And we've even, one of them might come to church with us. Our valet guy, when I was pulling out today, he swore and he came back and he goes, I am so sorry. You're, I know you're a man of religion. I'm sorry that I let that word out. I said to Tara, I said, how did he know that? We, we never told him that. You are a love letter. The living God written on your hearts to compel people to accept that invitation. Could you stand this morning, church, as we pray? The wedding feast, the banquet has been prepared. We don't know the date or the hour, but it's being prepared. And so what do we do in the meantime? We've got to take off the, the spectacles of status. We've got to stop looking at people and, and saying, you're worthy because of this. You're it's not what it's about, church. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to just take a time of prayer. First, if you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, we want to pray for you this morning. And so if that's you, Pastor Maureen, if you on this side, if that's you, we're going to open up these altars. We're going to have someone standing here. We're going to pray for you. Don't, we told our teens, don't leave the event on Friday unless you have an assurance in your commitment to Jesus. Because we don't know. Sister Ruth shared it as well. We don't know if we're going to be here tomorrow. We don't. And so if you're here this morning and you've never, and you're not sure of your commitment, if you're not sure when your head hits that pillow tonight that if you don't wake up again, are you going to be in the presence of that great banquet? Then we want to pray for you this morning. If I've lost my commitment to Jesus. I have, I have a heaps of excuses that I've used and I, want to, and I want to push those aside this morning. Then I want to encourage you to take just a few moments to come and just get into the presence of Jesus and allow him to just speak his word. I don't want to miss that banquet. And I know we as pastors, we want to see you at that great table. So I'm going to pray. If you need to leave, we'll dismiss now. You need to go. Don't let that be an excuse. So we'll make a kind of an informal dismissal as I close in prayer. But we're going to leave these altars open. And some of you need to just get with Jesus and reignite your commitment. And if you've never committed to Jesus this morning... There's a great banquet that God has prepared for you. You don't have to do anything. He's going to clean you up. He's going to give you freedom and deliverance. And he's going to use you for great things. All you have to do is to say, yes, Jesus, I accept the invitation. I check it off. I put it back in the mail. And I am saved and set free. That's going to be over here. So Heavenly Father, right now, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your presence. We pray for the series on the end times, God, in the upcoming weeks that we would go out into the byways and the highways and the, the street corners and we would invite all to come in and partake of the word of God. And Father, this morning I pray that if there's anyone in here who has not accepted you, that they would step forward in boldness this morning so that we could pray with them so they can have that assurance of salvation in their life. Don't let them leave without that opportunity. And for those that need to have their passion for Jesus reignited, oh God, would you show up at these altars, even for just a few moments, to soften hearts. Prepare us, God, for those who are serving breakfast in hotels, for those who are the janitors in our workplaces, for those that we've walked by and overlooked. Father, would you prepare these altars as a place for us when we go out, we would have your perspective. Jesus, show up. Let your presence, your manifest presence be at these altars, God. No more excuses. We're either in or we're out. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. These altars are open right now. Just come find a spot. We want to pray with you. Have a great week. Be Jesus. Be the love letter that Jesus writes to a dying, decaying world. 
But don't leave this morning if you need prayer. Amen.